whole segment in this series is a brief introduction to accessibility. We ought to be mindful of the ways in which diverse people interact with our communications. For example, I encourage you to turn on the captions for this video, and when you construct your own text in a predominantly visual medium, you too should include captions. If you're going to get your message across, achieve your purpose, then you need to communicate effectively with your audience, meaning your document must be accessible. To make it easier on your audience to read your document, you ought to follow some general observations. First, every document ought to have margins. Use blank space effectively. Don't overwhelm your audience with too many pictures and too much text that cover every square inch. Give the text some space to breathe. The font should be large enough to read, but not so big as to distract from your message. It's okay to be creative with some font choices depending on the tone and style of your message. But keep a few things in mind. If you start playing with the color palette, the font ought to contrast with the background. That's why it's easier to read black text on a white background more so than pink text on a yellow background. Don't expect your audience to squint to discern your message. Make it easy on the eyes. Additionally, I recommend using a sans serif font for most texts. Sans serif fonts are fonts that don't have those little feet on the individual letters. Something like Arial, Helvetica, or if you prefer a font with feet, try something like Courier, which adds a little more space between letters, making it easier to read. In a traditional writing class, your professors may require something like 12 point Times New Roman font. Always do what your professors or company requires for standard communications. However, in general, a sans serif font is easier to read, especially on a computer screen or for audiences with dyslexia. Notice how difficult it is when you choose a fancy cursive font. It looks interesting, but it takes longer to decipher each letter. I recommend one of these dyslexia-friendly fonts because each letter is clearly defined from those around it. To learn more, check out the study Good Fonts for Dyslexia, linked in the description below. Not all audiences are engaging with your documents in the same way. Some audiences, such as those who are visually impaired, might use devices like a doc reader to verbalize all of the printed material on the page. If your document has images, make sure you are including these audiences in the visual elements or multimodal design. You can do this by supplying alt text for digital documents or captions that explain what is in the image. Doc readers will pick up on this text and convey that information. Let's also consider audiences who are colorblind in our visual documents and multimodal writing. Certain color combinations are particularly problematic. According to Adam Silver, it is best to avoid these pairings. Green and red, green and brown, blue and purple, green and blue, light green and yellow, blue and gray, green and gray, and green and black. This is particularly important when visually representing numerical data sets, such as in graphs, in which colors indicate different sets of information. To make this easier for colorblind audiences, clearly mark each data set with text inside the graph and use patterns in addition to colors in something like a pie chart. Next, avoid overlaying text on a graphic background because there may not be sufficient contrast to ensure readability. Don't rely on color alone to indicate specific messages and options, such as hyperlink text. For alert messages, include an icon or large font messages that explicitly state error or success. For hyperlinks, underline the text and add an icon if possible. For further assistance, try one of these resources such as a color blindness simulator or filters that work in Google Chrome.
For those of us working in multimodal mediums, such as video, websites, live presentations, we want to avoid visuals that could trigger seizures for those experiencing photosensitivity or epilepsy. Some triggers include flashes, flickering, strobe effects, any quickly alternating colors and patterns. So be conscientious of photosensitive audiences. The Americans with Disabilities Act was only passed in 1990. It is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all places that are open to the general public. And among other things, it requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations. For more information on the tumultuous history leading up to the Americans with Disabilities Act and personal insights on its importance, I recommend watching this short four and a half minute video by Chella Mann entitled, Disabled People Are Badass, the 504 Sit-In. See the link in the description below. Let's talk about disability in language. Rachel Cohen Ruttenberg explains, disability metaphors abound in our culture and they exist almost entirely as pejoratives. You see something wrong? Compare it to a disabled body or mind. Paralyzed, lame, crippled, schizophrenic, diseased, sick. Want to launch an insult? The words are seemingly endless. Deaf, dumb, blind, idiot, moron, imbecile, crazy, insane, retard, lunatic, psycho, spaz. Nope. Words to avoid when that's not exactly what you mean. Totes and approaches. There are two ways of describing people with disabilities that are context specific. There's person first language, such as persons with disabilities, and there's identity first language, such as deaf people, that's deaf with a capital D. Generally, the Center on Disability and Journalism recommends using people first language, unless otherwise indicated by the individual or the group. So to give you a sense of how and when to use person first or identity first language, let's look at some specific examples. Disabled person is problematic because you're identifying a person as their disability. Think carefully about the negative connotations you may be uncritically imposing on someone else's experience. For example, wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair foregrounds equipment over the person. People who use mobility equipment consider these devices an extension of themselves. The equipment liberates them by making it possible to maneuver through the world. Those devices are just a different set of limbs. Best practices would be referring to a person who uses a wheelchair and perhaps explain what precisely the mobility equipment is used for. Saying something like, Brandon is disabled, suggests that Brandon cannot do anything. Instead, try people with disabilities, or Brandon has a disability. See how we just used person first language. In the past, I've used differently abled, but this doesn't exactly help much. Some of my more insightful students have pointed out avoiding the term disabled supposes it's a bad word, and some people are proud to be part of a community joined by their means of navigating the world. For example, there's the deaf community with a capital D. It's a culture with a specific language and customs. Some people are proud to identify as deaf people. Don LaPan, Laura Buzzard, and Maureen Okun point out that hearing impaired can be insulting because it imposes a negative connotation from the perspective of the hearing community. But deaf people, with a capital D, foregrounds an identity-based community, a culture in which hearing just isn't an issue. There is some debate on these practices. Writing for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, Lydia Brown explains, in the autism community, many self-advocates and their allies prefer terminology such as autistic, autistic person, or autistic individual because we understand autism as an inherent part of an individual's identity, the same way one refers to Muslims, African Americans, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, Chinese, gifted, athletic, or Jewish. On the other hand,
Many parents of autistic people and professionals who work with autistic people prefer terminology such as person with autism, people with autism, or individual with ASD because they do not consider autism to be a part of an individual's identity and do not want their children to be identified or referred to as autistic. They want person-first language that puts person before any identifier such as autism in order to emphasize the humanity of their children. On a related note, climate change activist Greta Thunberg identifies her autism as a superpower. She says, I have Asperger's syndrome, and that means I'm sometimes a bit different from the norm. And given the right circumstances, being different is a superpower. It makes you think differently. And especially in such a big crisis like this one, we need to think outside the box. We need to think outside our current system, that we need people that think outside the box who aren't like everyone else. There is no simple answer for an entire group of people. Part of being a scholar and professional is appreciating nuance rather than reducing people to narrow categories. Respecting how people identify and treating those identities on a case-by-case basis is part of exercising empathy and respect. Generally, I recommend using people-first language. So one might say people with disabilities or a person living with cancer. In this way, our language emphasizes personhood rather than difference. But always do your research and respect the ways in which people identify themselves in language. As I mentioned in our last session, you may be called upon to perform a live presentation. I encourage you to bring a few large print physical copies of your talking points and offer them for distribution to ensure that your speech is accessible to everyone. These are only some suggestions. As technology continues to evolve, I am hopeful that we will develop more, better ways to include everyone. Again, full citations and links appear in the video description below for quick and easy access. But here are a few super sources worth picking up for yourself, and some are freely available online. First, How to Be Good with Words by Don LaPan, Laura Buzzard, and Maureen O'Kune. This is basically the textbook on ethical communications. The authors provide a clear, detailed overview of some complicated issues so that you can think critically about your best practices. It's explicitly about making thoughtful language choices. It's implicitly about not being a jerk and learning how to be a better colleague and friend. Better Allies by Karen Catlin, provides some really helpful strategies for making workplaces more inclusive. The National Center on Disability and Journalism provides an alphabetized web source and a PDF style guide that covers how to use language and terminology effectively, including everything from ableism and addictions to survivors and triggers. The Allies Guide to Terminology, compiled by GLAD, quickly and easily breaks down terms and how to use them properly, as well as jargon that's just best to avoid. The focus is LGBTQ plus issues, terminology, and how to discuss sensitive topics such as marriage and adoption, but it's for everyone. For example, they suggest we avoid referring to anti-gay protesters as bigots because argumentative terms like bigot and hater alienate people. Instead, they encourage language that is carefully measured to open a dialogue so that we can create empathy for LGBTQ people and bring attention to the ways in which anti-LGBTQ positions cause unnecessary pain. The makers of this guide say, this series is grounded in a basic truth, that understanding our audience and meeting them where they're at with the language and descriptions we use is essential to connecting with those undecided Americans who can move from ambivalent to supportive when we reach out in terms they understand. Doesn't this sound familiar? They're literally citing the foundations of this course, right? Purpose to create dialogue that moves us towards equality. 
plus their audience, supposedly ambivalent or anti-LGBT, equals design, a crafted, respectful message that promotes inclusion. Finally, Chella Man, whose video I cited above, Chella Man is a deaf, trans, genderqueer, Jewish, Chinese artist and activist. Continuum is an intersectional text that challenges narrowly defined categories while introducing us to the purposefulness of being an authentic individual. This short text does a lot of work in a small space, developing empathy with people who experience the world a little differently. Now, it's up to you. Last time, I asked you to construct a personal diversity and inclusion statement. Now, make this document more accessible and appealing to diverse audiences. Think back to our conversations about multimodal writing. Add an image that makes your document more visually appealing. But here's a few things to consider. You can't just do an image search and take any old picture. Good professionals are mindful of intellectual property. Make your own image. Are you an artist or a photographer? Get creative and enhance your document. Or use a copyright-free image from a website such as Wikimedia Commons or Unsplash.com. On either of these websites, you can enter search terms, click through the available images, and find appropriate citation information. Remember, an image may be freely available to use, but a conscientious professional still gives credit where credit is due. So be sure to include a caption with your image. Now, whether you're supplying a caption or some alt text, you want to be mindful of visually impaired audiences. Include them in your visual document design. So, your caption and or alt text should also have a brief description of what is in the image. Then, supply any relevant citation information. Even if the photo is copyright free, cite the artist. There's a written explanation of this assignment in the expanded video description below. You're ready to submit your visually appealing and accessible diversity and inclusion statement. Refer to your teacher's instructions for how to turn that in. Thanks for watching. Now, let's make the effort to be more inclusive in our practices and mindful of other people in our daily lives.